I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Caroline and Vicky and Jenny this afternoon. Um, as Christina said, I've had the pleasure of being a mentor for the fellowship scheme in the last year or so. Um, so I've seen firsthand the creativity and the tenacity and the ethical values that our fellow, fellows have been channeling into their research um, in very challenging times as well. Um, so it's going to be a great session, I'm sure. Um, as Christina said, we're going to take questions at the end after all the three speakers have um, shared their presentations. So do keep putting your um, comments into the chat and questions into the Q&A function, um, and then we can pick those up at the end. Um, and just one other thing to say, um, some of the speakers have asked me to give them a five minute warning um, towards the end of their presentations. So don't be surprised if you hear me suddenly chip in uh, towards the end. Um, so to our first speaker, uh, who is Caroline Bolton. Um, Caroline is an archivist at the Special Collections in the University of Leeds, um, and she's worked in data and records management for local authorities in Greater Manchester before that for 12 years. Um, so she developed um, experience in metadata schemas, in digital records management systems and open data pilot projects. Um, and so she's transferred these skills to her current role as archivist in Leeds um, in 2016. Um, and since then, she's worked on cataloging projects that involve both digital archives and enhancing catalogues to improve the discovery of non-digital archives. And today, Caroline's gonna talk about her fellowship project, which is on archives catalogues as data, reimagining archival practice. So thanks, Caroline. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. Um, so why catalogues as data? Well, today I just want to share some of the experience and learning um, from the fellowship and how it's already informed the work that we're doing here in Leeds, and particularly to highlight some of the benefits and challenges ahead that I think a data-centric approach to cataloguing can bring in helping us to navigate the digital shift. So really the, the fellowship came out of my work in um, putting the funding bid together and I had to um, create an overview of the collection. And initially I looked at our online catalogue and as I'm sure, like most catalogues, I found I was presenting with a large number of items, um, limiting how I could refine the search and then also having to click in and out of each item to view the detail item by item. I could download the results, but again that was quite limited in number, so I couldn't easily get a holistic view of the collection from the front end online catalogue. However, when I went into the back end collection management system and it shows the metadata for the collection, I realised that it could be quickly manipulated to provide all kinds of insight that wasn't available to a researcher on the front end for navigating our online catalogue. So just looking at that metadata about location, subject, date and creators gave me a completely new view and understanding of the collection in a very short amount of time. So the end of the fellowship was really to look at whether we could do something different. Having previously worked on open data pilot projects, working with publication and reuse of local authority data, I wanted to see if there was something like an alternative way to make archive catalogues available and accessible and published as an open and licensed data set so that collection metadata could similarly be reused, analysed, mined, enhanced and visualised. And the aim was to explore the practicalities, benefits and challenges of exploiting that data within archive catalogues for both archivists and researchers with a view of broadening access routes into collections, improving discoverability and facilitating new insights that could support both digital scholarship and collections development and management. With a basic level of data literacy and no coding skills um, myself, I was very particularly interested in the accessibility of this approach as a way to bridge the digital skills gap for those that similarly wouldn't consider themselves programmers or digital humanities specialists or digital archivists that, that could still do some really interesting things with the wealth of intuitive tools that now exist. And particularly I was interested in how we as archivists might catalog in a way that still provides access but in a way that appeals to digital audiences that can also facilitate and maximise possibilities for researchers as well. So people will be smarter in the way that we catalogue both are enhancing legacy catalogue descriptions, but also in creating catalogues for new and increasingly digital archive collections. So one of the things that I think was a real benefit of the fellowship was that it allowed me to reinvent some time, focus and freedom to looking beyond my own organisation and learn from what else is going on. 
one of the things I did early on was to do a visit to the TNA and um, had meetings with many of the teams there to understand their work and challenges, both as a repository themselves and also as a sexual lead to the archive community. And although I discovered that their collections weren't exactly like ours, they had much more government and organisational records than our collections of, say, personal papers. They did have both similar and uniquely different challenges. And one of the things I found most useful was learning about two key infrastructure projects. Um, I think they called them Project Alpha, which was very much more around user journeys and understanding how those could work. Um, and also Project um, Amiga, which was really the underlying data models and metadata standards that made up their many catalogues and underpinned the ways um, into these collections. So I was able to speak to other organisations too, such as the Archives Hub, to find out more about their role as an aggregator and a discovery platform. And similarly, their challenges around the use of agreed persistent identifiers for authorities such as people in their names project. I also learned from listening to a number of case studies presented at the 2019 DCDC conference and made use of online tutorials. I participated in quite a number of webinars from organisations such as the British Library to understand similar cross-sectoral challenges um, to access and catalogs. And most notably, one of the, I think, most impactful learning opportunities for myself was when I took part in a pilot training session on a corpus linguistic tool as part of um, an AHRC funded project called Legacy of Catalog Descriptions um, and the Curatorial Voice. And it was here that I was introduced to a tool called Ankpom as a way to analyse text descriptions, which I will come on to mention in more detail. So in addition to all this research in parallel, I was also starting to work with two collections to see how I could apply what I was learning. Um, the first was the Leeds Archive of Vernacular Culture, um, shortened to LABC here. Um, a wonderfully rich archive of audio recordings, photographs, surveys, research papers from the 1950s to 1980s and focus on dialects and folk life and, and feature the surveyed English dialects. It was extensively well cataloged during the early 2000s, but it does feature some lengthy narrative descriptions that are less suitable for today's digital audiences. So the aim was really to enhance the catalogue to improve access. The second collection that I worked with was the Digital Archive of Writers in Emilia and Zygmunt Bauman, and that featured over 10,000 digital files made up of text, image, and multimedia documents. So to start with, it was really a case of extracting the catalogue data or the file metadata and simply playing with it in Excel, pivot tables, just to see what information could be gleaned, where data could be cleaned up or enhanced through standardisation of terminology or references, and particularly where there were any gaps. I looked at what we could do to integrate new access points such as people, organisations, place and subject as a way of providing new routes and intercollections and to also make connections across and beyond our own collections. I also start to look at the use of globally recognised persistent identifiers and standards for describing things like people, places or, or subjects to start to explore the possibilities for linked data, but also as a way to overcome the lim limitations of simple text formats, um, which can be prone to inconsistency and ambiguity. And finally, the kinds of tools that we could look to use to help us to do this at scale. So we started to experiment with things like spreadsheet add-ons to map geo-coordinates for place, and also experiment with open refine for data cleansing, but also for us um, to semi-automate matching kind of identifiers for some of the terms that, that um, were referenced in our catalogs using a feature called reconciliation services. So the benefits of, of of recording metadata in a much more structured and where possible standardised way are already becoming evident in um, our collection with the LABC. Um, just simply by listing informants, it's been possible to reveal the hidden role of women in the survey of English dialects and challenge the long held narrative that is a survey that was completed by male informants. We've been able to reconnect items separated across collections by listing their creators and providing insight into their provenance. We've also been able to transform place names into geo-reference coordinates to enable items to be put to a map, again helping with discovery and insight. Um, for example, it wasn't very clear from a, 
the narrative catalogue that there were items relating to Nigeria, but once we actually plotted those onto the map, it became very obvious that we had content that was outside of the VI Kingdom. And finally, we've been able to use the AntConc tool in a very basic way to help us identify problematic and potentially offensive language as part of sensitivity review. So, the main outputs um, from the fellowship is that we now have a very basic workflow for extracting catalog data. And already we've been able to use this to make data sets available to a number of research projects, such as a recent project to look at the correspondence and network analysis in the Bauman collection, which has already started to generate a number of new research inquiries. More recently, we've worked with um, some linguistic, linguistic scholars um, as part of a national archives funded testbed project to look at tools and methodologies for identifying historic bias and problematic language and catalog descriptions. We're starting to get a growing understanding of how catalog descriptions might be enhanced through metadata being more structured and standardised, whether that's to disambiguate or link. Um, and the options that we might have for doing this, looking at different standards such as VIA, Library of Congress, Wikidata, just to name a few. We also have a better understanding of options for resourcing this type of cataloging for both new collections and enhancing our legacy collections and descriptions. And this includes whether it's a role really for the archivist or actually an opportunity for diverse voices or specialists to help create catalogs via um, remote research, crowdsourcing and volunteering, especially in the COVID or uh, post-COVID world. And lastly, we have a growing awareness of the affordable um, open source and intuitive tools such as Open Design that seem to be constantly evolving to help us do this. And all of this has been shared in the blog series as, as my main output from the fellowship. But I think what the fellowship represents really is the testing of, a, of an accessible but very micro approach to using catalogues as data. We already know from the fellowship that there are benefits to adopting a more data centric approach to catalogues. And, you know, it certainly has offered opportunities to reduce and overcome the narrative in some of our catalogue descriptions. And that's providing an efficient way to enhance discovery for digital audiences, as well as reduce the risk of an intentional bias that narrative descriptions can sometimes invite as well. It's offered us opportunities to support new research and engagement through visualizations and data analysis. And it's offered opportunities to provide context by linking out to make connections within and across collections and organizations. I think it also offers a, a realistic way to make sense of the high volume digital archives and then massive item level met metadata that we're going to have to contend with. But I think with the kind of limitations of the fellowship I think to know is that really to really kind of realise the benefits, I think it is that kind of scaling up and looking at something on a much more a bigger scale than that micro approach. So one of the things that I think came out of the fellowship was really kind of learning more about, you know, there are also barriers to adopting catalogs as, as data as an approach which I think present issues for us doing this at scale, but also present wider challenges to optimising the types of digital access that technology now enables us to do and that increasingly audiences are going to expect. And I just wanted to quickly summarise what I think some of the key, key issues here are. Um, the first is the technical infrastructure to do this at both a local and organi a local organisational level with our own collection management systems but also at a national level in terms of the aggregators, the discovery and publication platforms, and the licensing frameworks that each one between those. Um, I'm certainly watching with interest the developments of projects uh, such as those that are part of towards national collection, um, really because it's those kind of cross-sectoral collaborations um, that will help us to kind of work out what these kind of things might look like. But I'm also keenly aware that to feed into these types of initiatives, and certainly from our own experience, we do feel like we are pushing the limits of the collection management systems in terms of managing access points and holding metadata associated with digital objects and being able to hold things like persistent identifiers that could make use of linked data services. Um, most of our systems, I suspect, are like ours, are based on ISAG genes, a cornerstone of, of archival description. Um, 
but this standard was obviously written you know, 30 years ago and probably more designed in mind for hand lists that ran top to bottom and general to specific. And I think we've been lucky that our system has the flexibility and um, that we've been able to tweak our system to, to accommodate the increasing amounts of data that we need to hold. But they do require you know, resources for these bespoke customizations and increasingly we need to do this more often, I would say. Which brings me on to the next point, and that's really around the importance of standards. Um, records in context is an emerging data standard um, or model, and possibly uh, a successor to ISAG, but I think with few exceptions, um, I've come across very few examples of, of kind of you know, moves towards this, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, conversation about what actually that would entail in terms of how we would kind of move towards that. And more broadly, there's a number of standards for describing and linking entities such as place, person, subject, and organisations. Um, but these only have value as well if there's some consensus on use or at least across walks to map them across, not just across the archive sector, but also the wider grand sector. And I think, fortunately, um, there does appear to be a lot of increasing discussion and work around this with initiatives such as Towards National Collection and the work of, of people like OCLC. Um, and lastly, just a note on the, the digital or, or data skills gap. I think data literacy is still a very specific requirement of being digitally literate and having at least a basic understanding of how to organise and manipulate the data that you need. Um, the training for spreadsheet applications is, can be quite limited in terms of using the for text data, as there are obviously you know, financial tools. And um, that's despite the fact that so many of us use them for cataloging and for imports into our collection management systems. I think free and intuitive tools such as Open and Fine offer possibilities to do more in terms of cleansing and classifying. Um, and more generally, I found that there is a, you know, there is a wealth of, of applications and open source software that can help to manipulate and visualize data. And these potentially offer a bridge um, in that skills gap in that you know there's less need perhaps for high level technical data skills as long as we have maybe the time and the competence to, to play and experiment with these types of tools. And lastly I think I just wanted to leave you with the kind of question that I've kind of come away with from the fellowship um, and that's really where does the digital shift start and that impetus for change come from and what comes first. So if we or our audience don't understand what's possible, then you know, why ask for more? And if we don't ask for more of our systems and articulate our requirements, then how will vendors respond to build systems differently? And similarly, if our systems remain the same, then our professional practices can't change um, to what they could become. And I think it's just kind of that, that full circle, then if our practices don't change, then what would that mean in terms of education? And now we continue to train the next generation of athletes in the same ways as our courses understandably have to prepare them for the working systems um, that they will encounter. And if they're not changing, then, then does that you know, adequately get reflected? So I just wanted to end with a, a thank you to my mentor, Andrew James, and his colleagues at the National Archives, as well as others who gave the time to talk to me. And finally, colleagues at the University of Leeds for their support, and obviously, RLU, UK and TNA for the fellowship. I think it's been an invaluable learning experience for myself professionally. I've certainly learned a lot along the way um, and also for the organisation I work for in terms of you know, the continued work that we're, we're doing this definitely set us off um, on a certain track to try and find out more. So thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, it's really interesting to hear the possibilities that you've uncovered and also the challenges which are not small are they so um i can see that um your research has really opened up a lot of questions as they always do uh, so our next speaker is um going to be vicky igloski broad um who is principal diverse histories record specialist at the national archives um, and in this role vicky promotes traditionally marginalized historical narratives within the state archive and strives to creatively engage new audiences with the collections um, and her developing research interests include the history of gender and sexuality, um, LGBTQ plus spaces, and 20th century social change and protest. 
Um, and I have a special interest because Vicky and I worked, well, I was Vicky's mentor, so it's really great to hear more about the, the piece of work that Vicky did. Um, and today Vicky's going to share uh, with us her project, which is on sex workers in the state, um, collaboration, ethics and challenging histories. So yeah, take it away, Vicky. Thank you. So just quickly, can I check that you can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, and I'm going to try and get my um, slides up, so bear with me. Okay, hopefully the slides are up okay. Um, someone do interrupt, please, um, if they're not, because I won't be able to see the chat. They're fine, Vicky. They're um, so hello, everyone. So I'm Vicky, and I work at the National Archives. Um, as Principal Diverse Histories Record Specialist. And my work essentially focuses on diverse voices in uh, our records that have been, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, in our records that have been traditionally historically marginalized. Um, so through 2019 to 2021, I explored the subject of collaboration, ethics and challenging histories through the fellowship opportunity that we're hearing about today. And that was with Research Libraries UK, the National Archives and the Wellcome Collection, who were a brilliant help through this work. So to take forward this piece of work, I focused in on the sample theme of sex work and the state. So in this kind of brief 20 minutes, I'll just be taking you through some of the findings from this work, uh, particularly discussing setting the groundwork for ethical collaborations and some of the associated records, records work to kind of underpin this, this kind of potential collaborative work. Um, so I'll first just detail some background, then reflect on how this work developed, particularly through the pandemic, how it kind of changed and evolved, um, and then just focus in on some of the intersectional records research um, that kind of developed out of this um, as, as the kind of groundwork to potential collaborations. Um, so for some context, my fellowship originally sought to address the challenges and rewards of working collaboratively to enrich our understanding and interpretation of what I termed challenging histories. Um, and I'll delve into that um, a bit more in a moment. Due to the pandemic, the focus shifted to particularly look at excluded voices in the records and how to address these excluded voices as a foundation piece of work to future potential collaborations um, with audiences. Uh, and this gave me space really to think in depth about the important groundwork that needed to be done to facilitate truly collaborative and ethical partnerships. Um, so I've kind of got this idea of, of what I term challenging histories. Um, and I felt that while collaboration is valuable in many other areas and disciplines, many of the challenges and rewards are particularly heightened um, in kind of relation to, to particularly challenging areas of the records. Uh, for institutions grappling with historical archival absences because of past collections biases, the benefits of co collaboration can be at their most valuable, um, but sometimes also their most kind of difficult and sensitive. Um, so the reason I kind of use this term challenging history was um, to think about histories that were historically and or currently sensitive, um, so particularly in relation to sex work, that not only was it um, a historically sensitive issue, but there are ongoing debates and current sensitivities. I also use this term challenging histories because it often um, they are histories that represent collection weaknesses, biases and silences. So they present a challenge in that way. And then I think pre predominantly I use the term challenging histories because actually uh, many of these marginalised histories um, present a challenge to ourselves, um, our own practice and conscious and unconscious bias as individuals and institutions. So it's more about the challenge they present to us rather than um, kind of stigmatising certain histories. Um, so I found uh, so I focused in on sex work in the state as a, a category um, to kind of challenge some of these ideas and test them, uh, particularly in the context of a state archive, which is a really unique context, I think. So hopefully you're aware to some extent of the National Archives collections and what we hold, but to kind of recap and set the scene. 
Our collection is one of the largest in the world, containing over 11 million historical documents and public records from doomsday um, to modern government papers and files to Twitter feeds. Um, it, there's a real range of materials. Fundamentally, our records were created and collected by UK central government departments and major courts of law primarily. Um, and in relation to sex work, the state has had a long and complex and largely negative relationship with sex workers throughout its history. And our records naturally reflect these biases. So this is a sensitive subject as women, men and non-binary people involved in sex work have historically been marginalised by individual society and the state. The state's attempts to regulate sex and sexuality has paradoxically left us with many potential sources, uh, often through policy, criminal, uh, police and legislation records. Ultimately, it's often through the policing of sex work in the past that we're left with so many rich and insightful records. And that in itself presents a contradiction and a difficulty sometimes, a tension. Um, so this can lead to certain challenges in the records, especially when working with collaborators with lived experience of the subject, such as current sex workers. Um, and these challenges can become significant barriers. So just to briefly highlight some of the challenges in the records, um, the records around sex work in the National Archives collections are generally framed by a state perspective. Uh, they often come um, through a, a legal, medical or moral lens. Um, there's problematic historical language in the records and subsequent cataloguing that we might now consider to be problematic and that can be a barrier. Um, there's a lack of obvious sex worker agency in the archives. It can be found, but it's it's challenging. Um, at times, there's a lack of intersectional sex worker experiences, although I'll um, reflect on that a little bit more in a bit. Um, women in particular are often either seen as perpetrators of crimes in relation to their sex work or um, as victims. So really kind of polarized um, viewpoints. And there's a lot around things that are still really sensitive issues, such as police regulation of sex work, which is uh, we see a lot in ongoing uh, contemporary debates. Despite this, there's huge value in the material held in archives and libraries relating to contentious histories, despite the omissions, biases and limitations. Um, I would argue that it is completely possible to reframe, contextualise and essentially reclaim the narrative in the individual in such records that come from these state perspectives. Um, so I've highlighted on screen just some of the ways that it's possible to challenge this, uh, reading records against the grain. For some collections, they're able to accession items. Um, we're not able to do that at the National Archives uh, to kind of accession missing voices as such. Our records just come from government. Um, and then one of the, the ways, again, we can mitigate that is potentially by collaborating with people who have lived experience um, of the experiences that you're historically discussing to, to kind of build connections through the records. So this wasn't something I was able to explore fully as much as I wanted to. Um, and that really brings me to um, how, I guess, um, the work kind of evolved uh, through the time that I was working on the fellowship. So this idea of working with people with lived experience was really key and it's still something I want to take forward further. Um, but really the COVID context, I think, was hugely important, particularly in relation to sex workers and their experiences. So the effect of a heritage project in collaboration with any marginalised groups affected by the current pandemic would potentially be unethical and exploitative. Um, this isn't a collaboration that was time sensitive. It wasn't about capturing sex workers' experiences of COVID, for example, um, which would be more time critical. Um, and so it, it kind of seemed like it wasn't, wasn't the key priority and it wasn't the right priority uh, for sex workers' lives. Many sex workers are fighting for day-to-day -day survival. Sex worker charities are running emergency appeals for funds, illustrating the urgency of the impact of the pandemic on sex workers' lives. Um, so there's a, a quote on screen that actually um, was a, a kind of pre-COVID uh, quote, but I think it's it's still very applicable here. It's from uh, Maggie's, the sex worker-led organisation uh, in Toronto. Um, and that this quote from their website says, our priority is to meet the immediate and long-term needs of sex workers in our effect to, efforts to live and work with safety and dignity. 
We are vastly under-resourced organization with limited capacity to do this. Um, and so in terms of the ethics that kind of already underlined the fellowship, uh, this was really key that it just wasn't the right moment in time to do this. But it did lead me to think about the um, ethics of collaboration and what needs to really underlie any collaborations that go forward. Um, so I had lots of conversations um, with Helen and her team and many other people uh, to think about the foundation work um, that needed to be done to make sure that um, collaborations were ethical from the outset. Um, I looked to develop some kind of ethical principles to underline any work that might happen um, kind of after, after the pandemic um, to take things forward. And I also worked on um, some uh, records based kind of foundation work to mitigate uh, any kind of barriers that I could see coming up from the archival side of things as well. Um, so one of the outcomes uh, that I wanted to share today uh, was some kind of common sense principles for ethical collaborations. Um, they're still a work in progress and indeed will always be part of a working set of principles that may evolve over time. Uh, each principle has been much more fully defined, but this is just the high level stuff, uh, just to give you an idea of what it covers. Um, so there's simple things like being, building trust and being transparent, um, and particularly with a government organisation, um, I think that's really, really key. Um, making sure that in the principles there is support for well-being, uh, time, space, uh, resource and money ideally for that in any projects that happen. Um, so these were some of the, um, the core underlying principles. Uh, and if, if anyone is interested, I'd be happy to share the more in-depth iterations of these principles and the context that they kind of developed out of. So do get in contact if that is of interest. Um, but what I really wanted to focus on today is the record side of collaborative practice. Um, and this is the element that's kind of developed um, relatively recently out of the fellowship. So some of it was developed at the time and then um, there's kind of been ex extra bits that have developed since, I guess. So I was um, looking at developing essentially an intersectional framework of questions to try and interrogate archival records further and find voices that even within the sex worker records that we hold were even more marginalised. Uh, to try and ensure essentially an intersectional foundation for any collaborative projects that, that did happen. So this research in part explored how it's possible to read uh, items against the grain of their original purpose um, and kind of read into the records, looking for what biases are in the records, whose, rep whose perspective they represent, um, any ways that they're framed that kind of changes the nuance of the, um, the material kind of re-asking certain, certain questions, whose voices are unrepresented, is there any way of mitigating that, um, are there any alternative research methods or phrases that could be used to, to um, interrogate the records, um, and really re-asking these questions very thoroughly to try and get the best, um, best research, the, the strongest intersectional kind of experiences out of the records. Um, so using this framework, which was developed really to support this idea of um, research to do with sex work, the framework can now be used to interrogate wider archival collections, which may hold records relating to other complex histories. Um, and this seemed particularly important when approaching a collaborative project to ensure that any record scoping captures the full diversity of a subject in the hope of better reflecting the audiences that we would potentially work with. Um, so the results were an intersectional approach to examining the voices that are missing from the mainstream narratives around sex work, particularly using the archives to highlight the experiences of male sex workers soliciting other men, sex workers we might now consider to be transgender or gender non-conforming, and also the experiences of migrant sex workers. And I've just got a few examples on screen for you. As a state archive, the National Archives holds many items relating to the experiences of migration and citizenship. Uh, these records intersect in a surprising way with past sex workers' stories, amounting to essentially a rich collection of records 
workers seeking to work in the UK. Um, and it was only through interrogating the collections in unexpected areas, using the framework that I was able to kind of uncover this potential. In some ways, this actually means that we have more details about these sex workers than those who didn't travel from abroad because there was an extra level of interest in their lives and kind of scrutiny by the government. These sex workers were often looked out for at borders, had passport details gathered um, and were also looked out for in case they'd had marriages of convenience, which sometimes means we have things like marriage certificates as well. In some of these files, in-depth statements were provided from multiple perspectives, giving a sense of individuals' livelihoods and life stories. However, this research process and words were essentially different from the mainstream um, sex worker narratives. Um, so the first kind of image on screen is the image of a woman who uh, on the catalogue is described as, um, well, it, the file is described as marriages of foreign prostitutes to British subjects to evade the operations of the Aliens Act and Order. Um, so uh, that individual was within this file that covers the 1920s and 30s in a Metropolitan Police record. And we also have associated passport um, information for her as well. Um, Alternatively, the middle image relates to a kind of different um, area that I interrogated in the records. Archival records are complex regarding gender identity. So rarely do we know exactly how someone would identify in their own words with their own choice of pronouns. However, there are surprisingly clear stories regarding trans sex workers in the National Archives records, um, again, because of the potential police uh, scrutiny. Um, while it was never illegal to uh, be transgender essentially, um, although um, it was difficult in terms of passports, uh, you can see that in terms of sex workers, uh, there was certainly an extra level of policing. And the picture in the middle is an assortment of rubber wear whips and a vibro machine used by a sex worker who when questioned said, I'm not a woman, I'm a male person undergoing a sex change. Um, now that's a really explicit example of someone we would now potentially to be uh, considered to be trans, although the, the language didn't exist in those terms at the time. Um, and it's really rare to get such an explicit example. Vicky, you've got five minutes left. Lovely. Thank you, Helen. Um, and then finally, uh, just another example. Um, the majority of cases involving sex work in the archives appear to be about female sex workers, uh, which correlate, correlates essentially with the historiography relating to the sex industry. However, there have also always been men who have sold sex predominantly to other men. As with so many other things historically, it seems like the societal assumptions about sex work were really heteronormative. Um, but some of the archival material um, sheds light on some of the, the lesser known histories here. So on screen are a selection of calling cards from the late 1880s. Uh, which were seized as part of the Cleveland Street scandal where a male brothel was discovered by police and the government was accused of covering up the scandal protect, to protect the names of wealthy and powerful patrons. So the calling cards belong to so-called professional Marianne's, essentially male sex workers. So they use this term Marianne's to kind of signify um, in the hope that it would suggest that they were seeing a woman, not a, a man. Uh, and these sex workers would be soliciting male clients. In, the, the, in times where sex work between men was criminalised, there's often confusing um, confusion in the archival records about when sex was paid for and when it was not, um, because to some extent all of it was criminalised in the eyes of the law. Um, but this example from the 1880s is an incredible insight, and we also have some fascinating examples of men soliciting other men in the 1920s and 30s, um, describing how they would meet other men and wear makeup and things like that um, through our Metropolitan Police files. Um, so some of this work has led to some recent things, um, a blog on the National Archives website about men soliciting other men, and also um, a blog for the Women's History Network about finding the fragments of sex workers' lives in the archives. Um, so yeah, just some examples of what that has uncovered. Um, so I'm now using this framework 
in the development of departmental training. The idea is to get everyone uh, in my department to be interrogating records in an intersectional way, questioning whose voices are framing our records and whose voices are most prominent, asking whose voices are absent um, and are there any ways to try and mitigate this or locate similar voices. Um, and then ultimately where there are archival silences, trying to get people to acknowledge them and to interrogate why this is. So this will hopefully be applied to subject areas as varied as our visual collections team, our military records teams, and our medieval archive materials at the National Archives. Um, so just some concluding thoughts. Um, this fellowship was a really great experience. It gave me the time to focus on uh, the ethical foundations of collaboration, which I've kind of focused on slightly less today, but also how to ensure an intersectional approach to the research and records. The research has helped surface ways of framing the archive to reclaim voices that have been traditionally marginalised within it by using a kind of uh, certain methodology to examine different historical experiences within the sex worker community very much a work in progress and I plan to do more to surface these excluded voices and take forward collaborations um, and as part of this I'd hope really to test more of these ideas in practice which was kind of what I originally hoped to do but was obviously very tricky with the pandemic context. I'm particularly keen to work on collaborative projects with current sex workers to reflect on the National Archives powerful but at times problematic records around historic sex work. So I hope that this short presentation has highlighted the potential stories it's possible to find within a government archive and to show how against the odds sex worker agency and experiences can still be found. Um, so many thanks to the Welcome Collection, the National Archives and Research Libraries UK for making this work possible. Um, and I'll obviously be happy to take questions later. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Vicky. It's really good to hear again about the work you're doing and, and all those critical questions that your research um, raised. Um, and I know that you've got lots um, in your head you know, to uh, work on in the future. So it'd be really good to keep track and you know, not only think about the collaborations that you hope to develop, but also that work you're doing internally with your the staff. That's really interesting to see how that works as well. So yeah, lots, lots to build on. Brilliant. Thank We're you. Over now to our final speaker, last but not least, who is Jenny Aspinall. Um, and Jenny is the Assistant Learning Officer in the Library and Heritage Collections at the University of Durham. Um, and Jenny has been there, I think, for eight years um, in customer- Very long time. Yeah, customer- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, lots of experience. Um, and, and much of that time uh, spent delivering learning activities and outreach for schools and communities. Um, yeah. And you describe your teaching practice as evidence-based and results-driven which sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so today Jenny's going to talk about um, how to use archival and special collections materials in an in a, no, I never say this word, innovative way to develop resources for secondary schools. Um, and I think Jenny's main aim was to think about encouraging greater participation in higher education from low participating neighbourhoods and communities. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Jenny. Over to you. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share slides in a moment, but um, I'm going to just talk to you, I'm afraid, for the first bit. So I hope you can deal with my face. Um, hello. Um, yes, I have been here at Durham um, for eight years. And I'm not going to lie to you, the majority of that experience was museum based and was also um, with primary schools. And my fellowship, as you've heard a couple of times now, was mainly about adaptation and that theme is going to come up again and again uh, to the absolute wild ride that was 2020. But when I originally conceived um, this fellowship, it was a reaction to 2019. Um, and we had new targets from the Office for Students looking at widening participation in higher education and um, whilst the research was saying that you had to start at primary and our bread and butter sessions were primary, the targets meant that we had to move to secondary uh, because we needed basically to get the end, report, end point a lot, lot quicker. This was something that was entirely new to me and we have uh, some incredible collections um, here at Durham. 
but the strongest for the secondary curriculum was ASC, so Archive and Special Collections Material, which was um, new to me. It was not something that I had extensive um, experience in. I'd done a little bit with um, Rosie Morris, who had done her fellowship before me. She'd actually come to visit us at Durham. She'd done some amazing resources um, with some Tudor and uh, with some Tudor, uh, I think it was inventories that we did, Rosie. And I was completely inspired. Um, by by her work so sort of as a footnote I said that I was going to have a look at some of the things that Rosie was doing and we were going to look at digital resources um, and the kind of first quarter of the fellowship sort of went as expected um, we started working with secondary school groups we were using archives and special collections which for me was an entirely new process so things such as researching catalogues um, the difference between getting students to engage with a physical artifact that you might find in a museum and then something that was written and also a physical artifact uh, that you might find in our kind of special collection was a completely new skill for me and something which was both translated but was terribly, terribly interesting. Um, my plan was to go to the TNA. Um, we had several, so we'd done some test groups, we'd done some learning. And uh, we had some more schools booked in. We had a whole project. We were going to use something called heat tracking data, which I'm imagining some people from university may be familiar with. Um, so that is data taken from younger students that basically tracks um, their achievement and whether they enter further education, higher education, jobs, things like that. So we were going to look at that data. And then it was March 2020. Um, and in March 2020, uh, midway through about, you would have found me with my forehead on the desk of the Bill Bryson Library here at Durham, um, having just received an email saying basically that my job, as I knew it, um, had temporarily at the time I thought come basically to, to a standstill. Um, and this was the point where a person who a few of you may know um, appeared uh, almost magically I think uh, that's Liz Waller who is our department head and in, an in incredible woman um, I am assured by Liz uh, that we had a full like 10 minute conversation uh, where she shared her expertise and her experience but I was in such shock at the situation that I honestly don't remember any of it and the only thing I remember was a piece of advice she gave me which she um, said fail fast Jen um, I need you to fail fast and she is a complete believer in the fellowship and, and wanted me to try things out and, and innovate as we've said earlier um, and my reaction to fail fast was <laughs> completely an utter rejection absolute rejection of the idea um, I've recently finished um, a Caitlin Moran book her latest book and she puts forward a piece of research that says um, as a woman or a person of colour or a member of the LGBT community, you are five times more likely to be fired on your first mistake than if you aren't a member of one of those groups. Um, so I was absolutely determined to succeed slowly. Um, and I very quickly learned actually the value of failing fast, both to me as part of this fellowship um, and also to my students as well, which has been a really, really surprising um, turn. Um, so in the middle of 2020, I um, went to lockdown. I turned up at my boyfriend's house with the immortal words of, it'll be three weeks max, Ed, it'll be three weeks max. Uh, turned on Teams, which was a terribly novel thing at the time and um, tried to come up with a plan. Luckily at this point, as part of the fellowship, uh, you fill in these sheets, which make you reflect on your practice. And, um, that has been invaluable to this process and one of the things that I got to do and it's been mentioned by both Vicky and Caroline was I got time the fellowship gave me time to innovate to a crisis in that situation my plan to go to the TNA was not going to work my plan to go into schools or schools come to me was not going to work um, so rather than it being kind of something I was mildly interested in, um, digital learning became a driver um, of what we needed to do to go forward. Um, and I'll show you a couple of things now, but I'm very quickly going to talk about that time that I got. Um, and very much like Vicky, we were approaching kind of communities and, and the answer was this is the wrong moment, uh, which gave me even more time to look at pedagogy. So digital learning isn't new. It might have been new to me, but it wasn't new. It's not a new... Um, concept or, or even field and Rosie has 
an incredible amount of experience and was so kind to me with the amount of times I called her as my um, mentor going, I have new information. And she was like, yeah, yep, yep. And then gave me some incredible solutions to problems that had been figured out far before I had come across them. This was the setup that Durham super, super kindly gave me. And I, I was given all of the tips and tricks and, and gadgets. And um, this is partly the setup, as you can see. So we had a DSLR camera and this was very much about, um, this fellowship was about me learning things as I went and, and accepting failure and adapting and, and going with it. And one of the things I learned within five minutes was that if you plug in a DSLR camera to a laptop, those two things don't talk to each other unless you have a tiny bit of kit called a cam link. How to use a visualizer, the best ways to use a visualizer and actually get students to interact. Um, so there it is all set out with all the lovely different labels as to what on earth things are. And here it is in action. Uh, so that's my amazing colleague, um, Emily, who is um, in charge of the tech. And there I am, uh, I assume teaching, but who knows, maybe just pointing. Um, and actually this was the setup that, uh, that we went forward with. And um, we basically developed an entirely new session for us, um, an entire new way of working, which was digital school sessions. These were um, basically hour long live sessions. So people called in just like you are now, I was on the end and I could talk to them live. We thought that was really important, as well as having the asynchronous resources for them to go to either before or after and have a look at, we really wanted that live element. Um, they were aimed at key stage um, three and four and particularly sixth form students. This is really interesting. They were all topics linked to the curriculum, although that's changing. Um, we're getting teachers more and more asking um, for things that are not linked to the curriculum, that are actually expanding their students' knowledge. And one of them um, actually is, is, again, to echo some of the things Vicky said, is LGBT history um, and looking at getting students um, interested in, in kind of uh, histories that may not be on the curriculum per se, um, all of them, and we come back to that widening participation idea, were based around skills you would need for university. And we were very, very strong, and I was very strong at both signposting these skills. Um, we found that with this age group, we very much had to sell the session to them, not just to their teacher, but to them. And to say that um, this is why this is important, signposting the skills and knowledge and um, the way in which it would help them if they were interested in university. So we set these up as almost as seminars. And I mentioned earlier about the importance of failure um, and the session itself has that in it. So we set them pre-work um, just as you would have in many higher education institutions. And if they don't do it, the first 10 minutes of the session is a little bit awkward, I'm not gonna lie. Obviously there's a plan B for if they haven't done it. But one of the really important skills that we got and the feedback we got from both the students and the teacher was they really loved the idea that if you didn't do it, we had to spend 10 minutes doing it, which means you missed out on something else. And that these students really wanted to learn that now before they headed to university, the idea of independent learning. And obviously all of this had collections at its core. Um, so these, as I've said, it was very much skills-based. Um, and what we found with the students, which in a museum is, is slightly different, was that we had students were struggling to engage with the um, ASC material almost as an, as an artifact. They wanted to know because often in school they had been either given a transcript or questions related to an item and they wanted to know how this was relevant to their studies now. We often had to kind of reverse them a little bit and get them to look at these items as physical items. The idea of additions, so the game that you can see is literally a spot the difference, uh, which is um, fun, but also it teaches you an importance. For example, the importance of damage. The fact that this item has things missing means you're gonna miss information. Uh, these two items are actually um, different additions as well. So the idea of there being different information in different additions. And, um, and this was some of the feedback we got which was um, overwhelmingly positive. Um, they were so impressed with it that actually, um, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, Miss had a, she ran into a little bit of a problem where her students kept putting the session in UCAS applications and she kept being like, can someone write about something else? Um, but actually um, working with tech as well on a personal level for me was an entirely new thing and imposter syndrome hit fast. Um, so, I was very much, I, it kind of got out that, oh, Jen's doing, Jen's doing digital learning, um, ask her questions. 
And I became very quickly aware that being good at tech is a complete myth. It's a skill like anything else, like playing an instrument, like a language. The more you practice it, the better you get at it. Anyone can do it. And Rosie was extraordinary in the many phone calls there were with me going, but anyone can do this. I'm just YouTubing stuff and telling people what I learned. Um, and actually part of this reflective process was, was very kindly um, Rosie saying to me, you know, you're taking the initiative to look at this information. You're taking the initiative to then spread it and use it. Um, and the fellowship was the thing that really, really super supported me in doing that, of allowing me to be reflective, of allowing me to mess up. The first sessions that I did were fairly experimental. Um, and I was continually surprised by both the schools who allowed um, my relationship with them basically means that they allowed for certain things. They allowed it for the tech not to work or for me to try things out. The first time we did the seminar and I said to the teacher, what if they don't do the pre-work? And she had the confidence of going, I trust you that, you know, you can adapt and, and talk to them about why that might be important and why that might be an important skill. Um, and I was continually surprised. So I suppose I come back to that idea of, of fail fast and how working within this crisis has actually taught me the value of adapting um, and the ability to um, look at a problem and then adapt, look at a problem, then adapt. Um, so what are we doing next? Um, as well as continuing um, with the live sessions, which we're doing at the moment and they are becoming more and more popular, um, I will say that um, primary school particularly has hit, um, we found this, this term particularly has hit a digital fatigue, um, particularly primary school sessions we found. Whilst with the secondary school sessions, um, there is still an absolute appetite for those. And um, one of the things that we found is that it's not just within our local area that people wanna do sessions. I know I've spoken to Rosie about this uh, and it, she uh, has a similar experience of it being, because it's a digital session, you can dial in from anywhere. Um, but yeah, it's been an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. And I'm so grateful. And I want to say thank you um, to, to everybody who's helped me, Rosie particularly, who's been brilliant. But the way in which, yeah, the fellowship is set up is it's an extraordinary opportunity. And if any of you are thinking about it, I'd absolutely encourage you to do it. Right, so I'm gonna um, stop rambling, I think. I think I may have run out of time. Have I, Helen, or can I keep going? No, if you want, you've got another five minutes. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, I was going, I think, on the old timings that we had. Um, okay, so I will talk you through um, some of the videography stuff that we have, she says. So um, another thing that I got to do as well as the live sessions to look at asynchronous resources. So video editing became a, um, a massive part of what I now do um, and pedagogy that backed that up. So things such as 12 molden, blah, 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 the 12 multimedia principles of mayor. Oh, you want to say that fast, don't you? Um, which are a brilliant framework for creating videos that um, help students to learn in every way possible, both through audio and visual. Um, the first video I did was meant to be a 20 minute lecture um, and we recorded loads and loads of stuff. And in the end, there were five usable minutes of items. And I learned a lot about the skills of presenting to camera, about the amount of material that you need to um, prepare um, and yeah again the idea of kind of having the opportunity to fail and then adapt um, and also it then turned out that there is some recent research that's come out of China which says that the average or the like optimum length for a video uh, for you to learn from is seven minutes long um, and this research has really guided kind of the asynchronous resources that we've made and also the live sessions as well, where we started very much breaking them up into um, seven minute chunks um, and also adding interactive elements in there as well. So one of the things I got from Rosie was we started doing actions games as well. So um, literally yesterday I was teaching a prehistory class, uh, it was year three, and we were learning about paleography, not paleography, I've got the wrong word, haven't I? Um, paleography, there we go, no. But Paleolithic, there we go, blimey, my brain, I've not had enough coffee. And in the Paleolithic, you obviously get modern humans, so we'd go, us. Oh, and then we had the Mesolithic, where um, you get the melting of ice water, so the students were going blah, 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 blah. 
to show the rising sea levels. And then in the Neolithic, you get farming. So you get them pretending to farm. And by using these interactive elements, and one of the things I came to Rosie with was that um, due to kind of digital poverty throughout the Northeast, but, but more generally as well, sometimes the, the uh, internet connections were so dodgy, I couldn't see the students always doing the actions. Or um, if I needed them to answer something, I couldn't always see if they'd got their hand up. So it was all about developing that relationship with the teacher to feed back to you and being very clear with the teacher as to kind of what the expectations are to say, hi, you're gonna need to say, hi, Jen, James has got a question for you. Um, or as Rosie taught me, just to make the actions bigger. So for yes, putting two hands up, for no, putting arms right out so that I could really see those exaggerated movements um, and kind of all sorts of interactive ways um, in which we could do learning. So we started doing quizzes where you uh, could do one, two or three as an answer. And obviously you could just hold up or do a sign to show which one you wanted to pick. Um, and yeah, it's been a real, real challenge uh, working in digital learning in 2020. And we are still um, waiting for the opportunity to kind of have students back in the archive. And I think one of the things that I'm gonna end on is that um, there is a real, real value to the physical, um, or the physicality of these documents as well, which is something that you struggle to get across um, digitally. And um, working with kind of the archivists uh, around me as well, and the issue of copyright, can I photograph an item from the archive and send it to a student? Like what are the um, copyright implications of that? How does that work? What wording could we use? Um, and these were things that the TNA absolutely kind of already had in place and their help was invaluable in going, hi, this problem I've just discovered, you probably already have a solution for this. Uh, and Rosie was absolutely completely invaluable um, in the kind of answers and the things that she gave me. So thank you so much for listening. I'm really looking forward to the different questions um, that you're gonna come up with. So Helen, can I pass back to you please? Yeah, thanks very much, Jenny. I have to admit that my laptop crashed right in the middle of your talk. Oh, no. I'll do it again. I, yeah, please. Um, <laughs> I'll catch up separately, but I did hear the beginning and the end, thankfully. There we go. Uh, and it was so interesting to hear you talk about reflective practice as well, because that's something that we're thinking a lot about at Welcome, and I'm thinking about. Um, and that idea of failing fast, it's, it's scary to deliberately be willing to fail, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely terrifying. And also it's it's the thing that I learned was it wasn't just terrifying for me, it was terrifying for my students. Mm. Um, I think it is terribly hard to be a young person right now, particularly a young mm. person in, in kind of looking towards higher education. And the ability to experiment with something, the ability to just risk not knowing, mm. I think is, is something that's, and being able to learn early, I think is, yeah, it's a real, and also the, there's a question which became notorious on the form which is, are you on track? And if ever there was a question you didn't want to be asked in 2020, it was, are you on track, right? Mm -hmm. the, the kind of having to go through periodically and say, okay, so am I on track? Well, the answer is no. Um, but how am I going to adapt? How am I going to keep going? Like, what is possible? What isn't? Yeah, it was, I think, really, really valuable, even kind of going forward and kind mm -hmm. of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think that's something that comes out from, all our speakers today is like, yeah, the way you've, all of you had to reflect, uh, switch tack, um, be really creative. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for everybody uh, speaking. It was really brilliant to hear you. Um, and thanks to everyone for putting questions in the um, Q&A as well. I see there's things building up in there and there's some nice comments in the chat function as well. Um, I've got to head off now, but I'm going to hand over to uh, Christina, who's then going to introduce the next session and enjoy the discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Helen, for sharing, and thank you to everyone for sharing your fantastic work and your experiences, um, the, the experiences uh, through your fellowships. And uh, now I would like to welcome uh, Rosie Morris, who is the uh, Education Web Officer at the National Archives, and she's going to turn the discussion session. Um, Rosie, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Christina. Um, and also, thank you, Jenny. Uh, you're very, very good for my ego. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, I, I'm very, very um, happy to be chairing this uh, next section of this session, um, which is a Q&A with all of our uh, speakers today. So, uh, Caroline and Vicky, if you'd like to yeah, turn your, your cameras back on and, and microphones on and we can 
um, start this discussion. There are uh, quite a few questions in the in the chat and in the Q&A already. So um, if you do have any questions for our speakers, please do feel free to, to type them away in there. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll try and cover as many of them as possible. Um, I'm probably just going to ask them uh, in the order that they came in. So we'll be starting off uh, with some questions for you, Vicky. Um, so the first one um, says, would you define this form of collaborative e ethics uh, as a way of, to practice public history? Um, what would you say about that? Um, yeah, so I've been reflecting on some of the questions, which are, are great. Um, so, I, yeah, I definitely see it as, as a potential approach for public history. Um, I guess I should say I'm I'm not an archivist. I work in an archive, um, but a lot of my work is around engaging people in the materials. Um, so I would say I practice public history a lot day to day, whether it's in our reading rooms, talking to members of the public or um, trying to come up with events or blogs or things like that. So um, this framework is now something that, that I think about kind of all the time to inform my work, to make sure it's ethical um, and in terms of the record stuff, intersectional. So from my personal experience, I definitely say it can be, um, yeah, used as a way, um, a form of. Uh, kind of a way of approaching public history I guess ethically um, and that's something I do day to day so yeah from my perspective certainly um, but you know really interested to hear other people's opinions on that as well. Yeah I think it's a really interesting kind of aspect of the professional fellowship scheme um, both this year's cohort and the previous cohort that I was actually part of um, a lot of us haven't been kind of archivists or, or, or um, actually a lot of us didn't even do kind of research as our kind of main part of our jobs um, so the the fellowship allows as you all have said today some time and some um, focus to be able to to develop our, our professional practice in a different area or to do that research that will help us progress in our careers uh, and in our, our handling of the collection in a way that benefits the public um, it, which your project certainly has um, so I'm yeah I'm going to move on to the next question which says how do you balance representing complex histories in archives and making records accessible to researchers through things like subject in indexing um, which in essence can be quite restricting as you have to essentially attach labels to records in order to aid that discoverability? Yeah, I think this is a really, really tricky one. So again, that's part of the reason I want to say that I'm yeah, not an archivist by background. So it's not something I necessarily work with day to day, although we're all kind of thinking about the, the ways of making our items more findable. Um, and I think there's a huge tension between the ethics and the language we might use now and what we use in the collections to catalog the collections potentially. Um, and there is this tension between findability um, and what are the most logical words people are going to use to come to our collections and then what are the right and ethical ones um, and I think there needs to be um, a kind of a, a bridging somehow between the two um, so it's not something I particularly focused in on this piece of work but it's something that we're definitely working on all the time um, so I don't yeah I don't really have answers but I think um, the welcome collection is actually doing really innovative work in this area. So it's a shame Helen had to dash off. Um, but they're, they're doing a lot of work, um, I believe, kind of consulting with groups about the cataloguing of uh, their library collections and the terminology that should be used there. Um, but I think it's it's just a continual debate for all of us and discussion. Uh, it's one of the most kind of significant things. And certainly in terms of our collections at the National Archives, we tend to catalogue with the language of the time because language is always evolving. Um, you know we don't know if our language will necessarily be acceptable in 20 years time or, or whatever the case may be um and that's i guess the most authentic way because we don't know necessarily when it comes to things like particularly lgbt history what pronouns someone would use how they would identify before the language actually actually existed so um yeah i think there's a lot of interesting work to be done there and I guess my my work was kind of on the fringes of some of those discussions, um, but it's a difficult one and I think it will keep us all occupied for some time. Absolutely. And um, you, you shared with us your 12 principles um, that you came up with as kind of a result of, of the research that you um, have done. Um, do you have any plans to kind of share those principles with um, the kind of wider archive sector to really try and spread those kind of um, those ethical ideas uh, with other organisations beyond TNA and the Welcome Collection? 
Yes, I'd be really keen to, although I am conscious that they're so constantly evolving that I don't really want to put something kind of static out there. Um, and even since, yeah, since the kind of deadline, I guess, of the fellowship, the final piece of work, they're, they're still evolving and I've had more me meetings since. So, yeah, I think it's for me to think about the best way to share them while kind of making them kind of a, a changeable document, maybe. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, I'd be very grateful to receive them. But um, yeah, I'm definitely keen to get them out there. Great. And um, Caroline, I'm, I'm moving on to you now with this next question. Um, can you say anything more about the methods the testbed project to locate uh, problematic descriptions uh, will employ? It sounds really interesting. Yes, it's just kind of come to an end actually as the testbed project. Um, so they, have, they are open to uh, share the resources for it, but I think a lot of it was around scale and applying computational methods to, to looking at legacy descriptions because obviously, you know, we've, we've got hundreds of thousands of, of legacy descriptions and obviously the, the text within them as well can be quite dense. So I think there were kind of two strands to it. Partly it was about building a glossary of terms and that was obviously very much um, contingent on what, what the collections you, that you're working with because obviously in different contexts, different words mean different things. So from a linguistic point of view, I know there was a lot of um, research into how those could be used and how they may kind of you know flag up. And then the, the second part of it was then how you could load those glossaries into a tool such as the Corpus Linguistic Tool that I mentioned before, which was Ancomp. Um, to identify, as I say, kind of like raise those flags to say these words have been mentioned here. And I think what it was in terms of scalability, I think what it was doing is, in, you know, you could look at the count and you're going from 12,000 words that you might need to check down to maybe eight. It may be that those are false positives, but it's just about that scalability of the resource. It, it takes for us to kind of check those catalog descriptions. It makes it much more manageable. So as I say, I think they're hoping um, there are two and um, linguistic scholars that are involved with that, so they're hoping to share those as well. And um, do you see the idea of, of, yeah, kind of data mining these these catalogues as something that should be, I guess, researcher led, or is it something that um, organisations and, and archives and research libraries can really build into their kind of um, their, their UX, their, their um, digital versions of their catalogues? Can they learn from this kind of um, cataloging project in order to develop their, their public facing side to uh, make those tools easier and more accessible to the general public at large? I think I think it's both. I think when we kind of um, wrote the bid we were very much kind of keen on, on it being a tool for archivists to be able to use but also to engage researchers and I think really um, it's, it's about still engaging with different stakeholders that may know more about those collections or those communities that are represented in there. So I think that's where you get the opportunity to kind of work with communities or um, researchers that are outside kind of the archive community. So I think it's both really. And I think it's, um, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, for a small archive where it's just an archivist on their own, perhaps, they're not going to have that, you know, that resource to be able to kind of go through their collections it's something that they can perhaps engage other people to help them do. Yeah, and on a similar note, uh, there's a question here that says, would it be useful to have collaboration between GLAM professional bodies with Wikimedia UK uh, develop, to develop things like online lessons to help us create, share and enrich collections and item data with linked data um, and attempt to level the playing field um, and, and share cost of development for a mutual benefit, kind of, yeah, creating a, a set of standards across the organisations. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think Wikidata is something that um, our organisation has been looking into. I've got some colleagues that have been working a lot more closely with Wikidata. And I think it definitely presents opportunities for us to link different collections. And I think probably as well, um, I suppose it's kind of, you know, it's domain independent. It's not, it's not any kind of, it's not libraries, it's not museums. And I think we need to kind of understand the role that Wikipedia, which links to Wikipedia as a, you know, most people when we go and do their research, they'll probably start a Wikipedia page. So from a discovery point of view, for us not to link in to something as big as Wikipedia or Wikidata um, would seem strange. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's definitely um, potential for collaborations to understand how we can kind of hook into all that kind of architecture. Great, thank you. Um, and Jenny, over to you now. 
Um, so this, this comment says, just to say your discussion was superb. Um, oh, I'm wondering, <laughs> wondering in terms of making connections with the schools and how this okay. was done. Um, was it through a school's liaison team or did the schools get in touch directly? Um, also, do you have a video team within the library or is this a central university resource? Um, OK, so I'll, I'll do them in two different parts because my dyslexia otherwise will just mean that we end up on some magical mystery tours. So, Rosie, please jump in if I start to go off on the magical mystery tour of, of wonder. So the first bit, um, how, how are we contacting schools? Um, so it, it isn't through a, a liaison team, although Durham is currently trying to put, take all of these different outreach groups that are in different departments and kind of centralise us more and having have us talking more. So I'm hoping that that's going to feed in with more schools. Um, it's from basically long working relationships. Um, so working with um, local school teachers, both secondary, um, knowing who to contact is really important. So we do do marketing, but knowing exactly who your history department lead is, um, what they're interested in, what their timetable is, um, that is an incredibly important thing because we've often found that if things are sent to the school centrally, that's where they stop. Um, so actually having a personal relationship with your history leads or um, sociology leads, politics leads, I'll, I'll stop naming um, subjects, I promise. Um, that's really important. Um, what has become incredibly surprising for you, and I'm going to be very sorry to that person, this is an unsatisfactory answer, is that it's growing beyond that. Um, we're having schools contact us and we think it's through basically web optimization. Um, that's how we think it is. But one of our processes of working with these new schools is being like, hi, how did you hear about us in Kent? Like, how? how? Um, and, and also, I think I'm super lucky for the institution that I work for has a really good reputation. And, and that helps teachers be like, oh, it's Durham. I know what I'm going to get, the sort of quality and um the way in which we're going to engage so we do our own marketing um schools contact us directly which can be really really helpful sometimes in just being able to really understand what you can offer a teacher and also being able to answer questions almost immediately to say okay well this is what this session entails here's the content um how do we tailor it to your students um do we have students who have like send um, and here are the things we often find that it, it, if we do have send students, it's easier for us to offer a solution rather than say, you know, for a teacher to say, well, you know, this might be helpful. If we offer solutions, we get better answers um, and, and better basically access. Um, what was the second bit, Rosie, before I start? Um, it was, do you have a video team within the library or is this a central university resource? But we do not have a video team. We definitely do not. And Rosie will be able to tell you that from the panicked, <laughs> panicked teams calls. Um, so we do have a central comms department and we do have a framework and we do have certain things we have to use and such and guidelines. Um, but it has been trial and error um, very much in terms of producing stuff. So in terms of writing scripts, in terms of um, directing the material, um, in terms of filming the material and editing it, that is in house which has been an explosion of skills for us that we simply, to be honest, didn't have before. We are extremely lucky in that Durham has given us a lot of the software that we need as well as the hardware, say things I'm currently using Camtasia, mixed emotions about Camtasia, not gonna lie, um, but that's what we're using um, and kind of audacity for podcasting and, um, and things like that. So we've been doing audio guides as well. Um, in-house so yeah it, it's in-house whilst we do have guidelines it's been us making things and very much us keeping ourselves to a high standard and reaching out to people um, such as Rosie being like hi jump cuts look awful how how do you make them look less rubbish and the idea of kind of zooming in a bit maybe doing multiple um, angles to um, things copyrighted music understanding where you can get music that isn't copyrighted from um, it also depends on the platform that you want to put things in um, Durham has very different rules for different platforms its strictest rules apply to YouTube I think I don't really need to explain that do I it's going to reach the most amount of people so therefore um, it needs to have a, you know be really high quality and it has slightly less higher standards um, for kind of the internal things um, so if we were going to experiment with something that's maybe where we'd start um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. If you want more information, please let me know. Great, thank you. Um, 
and yeah, I think something that's really come out through all of the discussions um, has been the the help and support you guys have found um, from your partner institutions and from from working collaboratively and, and all the discussions that have happened throughout the scheme. Um, a question's come in that says um, it seems like really productive new networks and connections are being developed through these fellowships. And are there any ways that uh, these could be supported beyond the fellowship timeline? Um, but I'd also just like to kind of expand on that slightly more in, in asking you, yeah, how how did working with your partnership um, organisation aid your project in the first place? Um, and that's kind of open to all three of you. So whoever wants to jump in first. Um, I can go. Um, yeah, so working with Welcome was just incredible because they're so forward thinking in their inclusion team. Um, so it kind of constantly had me on my toes and challenging my own thinking and and practice um so they were really helpful they were also really just generally kind of supported and open-minded and we are now working on kind of having a a group kind of network where we continue to discuss inclusion practice going forward so we can share our best practice between tna welcome and maybe some other institutions so there's something kind of longer term that's come out of that as well um but yeah it just um from the second I kind of started the fellowship, they, they just got me thinking in bigger and bigger ways. Um, and that was incredibly helpful um, because, you know, I'm sure most institutions, we can kind of get stuck in our own little bubbles and um, kind of forget about the bigger picture and all those things. So yeah, just the, the challenge it presented, I think, to some of my own ideas was really, really enriching, if nothing else. Caroline, how about you? I think I said a little bit about that initial visit for me at the National Archives and meeting all those different people from different groups. I think naturally the National Archives is that sectoral lead, so you know they are naturally quite innovative and research focused. And I think for me it was really useful having all those ideas in one in one place. You know there were people I could talk to about um, AI and different things around data models and where they're going with things. So it, it was, yeah, for me it was. Um, it was really good to kind of work with that kind of, you know, organisation where they are so kind of far ahead of the curve because of their role as a sectoral lead. We need to then kind of reflect that back into our organisation. Sure. And Jenny? Um, so I think my answer is going to be um, slightly more informal. Um, for me I'm, and the project that's ongoing and learning is one of those things that evolves by the second digital learning evolves probably even faster um, and it is evolving immensely um i was reading a report that says in terms of digital learning they believe in the last one year we've advanced five years into what we were expected and it's it's going fast and it's evolving with with teachers as well who as i've mentioned earlier primary school particularly have hit digital fatigue in, in the experience that, that I'm having at the moment, um, whereas secondary are really embracing it. Um, so it's kind of a little bit more informal. A lot of the time is me just emailing Rosie and Rosie emailing me and being like, hey, do you wanna, do you wanna get a coffee and, uh, and Zoom and see how you're doing? Um, but also I think that is, uh, particularly with digital learning, is that there are certain people who are doing things, talking about them, and the ability to kind of know who that is, um, to kind of um, email them and say, hi, I'm stuck on this. Chances are you've already done it. Um, or what are you doing? Um, so at the moment, I think it's kind of, for me, been a more informal relationship. Um, but also, I think, uh, talking to people around me and saying, hey, have you considered doing a fellowship um, as well? And kind of being almost annoyingly evangelical about, the opportunities it's afforded me and the amazing people I've got to meet because both the TNA and and our, oh, my dyslexia can never cope with this, RLUK um, have so many connections and like Christina literally knows the, the amount of times I'd email her and she was like yes I know exactly the person you need, incredible. Um, so despite the fact I think it's um, fairly informal in terms of my project, I think that these things have a way of kind of almost organically growing, particularly in terms of learning um, and the way in which teachers and educators talk to each other, sometimes rambly and for ages. So I'll pass back to you, Rosie. It leads me nicely onto my last question, actually, which was what advice would you have for anyone considering uh, taking on the professional fellowship scheme and, and becoming one of the next cohorts um, to, to give it a go? 
again, that's to all of you. So whoever wants to jump in first. <laughs> Shall I? Um, so I'd probably give two pieces of advice. One, maybe don't do it in a pandemic. Maybe pick another time. Don't like, I know that that's hard and that you can't see that coming, but like maybe don't do it then. Um, but but I think seriously, it, it would be don't be afraid to when it says, are you on track? Right? No, I'm not on track. Like, I know it's been a theme, but actually the ability to adapt and embrace that. Like this is an incredible opportunity to learn. And sometimes learning means failing and adapting. Um, pick your mentor um, so that they have like similar interests. Really make sure that they are super interested in what you're interested in, that they have time to do this as well. Um, so I think those are kind of my two, three pieces of advice. One, maybe avoid a pandemic. Two, do not be scared of adapting and failing and going with it. And three, yeah, really build that relationship with your mentor. They will be invaluable in providing Harry Potter quotes to make sure you feel better. Thank you, Rosie. You're very welcome. Vicky, on to you. Um, yeah, very similar advice. Just um, I think embrace having some time kind of to do this stuff, um, permission to have some time to focus in on um, fellowship stuff, because I don't know about other people, but you know, life can be busy. And often you don't have that moment to really pause really reflect on your practice um so i really recommend doing it so you do have that time um where you don't feel guilty focusing on this stuff um and you can yeah kind of really delve deep i guess into some of the more theoretical things um so yeah i'd, I'd say that's the the biggest plus of doing it and um that's the reason i'd i'd recommend it also the first thing that came to mind was yeah don't do it in a pandemic but great and caroline I would agree with both Jenny and Victoria. I think um, it's very, you know, few and far between opportunities where you get to really kind of indulge your interest in something and really have the opportunity to kind of dig deeper with it. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, getting to that place where we're moving on, isn't it? You know, there's always you know, something else to be doing, whereas this actually gave you that focus and that, like I say, that freedom, I think, for me to really kind of dig deep. and in a very short amount of time for my own um, professional development I think it was a you know a massive learning curve that I don't think I would have done in my ordinary work I think you know you can still work in innovative organizations and you can learn a lot along the way but I think it really did fast track how much I learned in a, in a quite a short amount of time. 